Good evening. Will the Standing Committee on Public Accounts please come to order? This meeting has been called to consider the list of reports listed in the summary of committee information before you all. I believe there's a prior agreement that the committee complete consideration of the following items without debate. Our Auditor General's report, follow-up of previously issued recommendations, May 2015. Section 9, Taxation Division, Audit Branch, Section 18, Senior Management Expense Policies. Auditor General's report, follow-up recommendations, May 2016. Food Safety, Taxation Division, Audit Branch, Senior Management Expense Policies. Uh, Auditor General Report, follow-up recommendations of March 2017. Office of the Fire Commissioner, Senior Management Expense Policies. And Auditor General's Report, follow-up of recommendations, March 2018, Rural Municipality of Lac de Bonny. Does the committee agree to complete consideration of these uh, sections? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Are there any suggestions from the committee as to how long we should sit this evening? Mr. Martin. Chair, I suggest uh, two hours. Reassess at that time, suggest if we're not completed. Suggested that we sit for two hours and then reassess. Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. We will now consider the Auditor General's report titled Management of MRI Services dated April 2017 and subsequent follow-ups. For the information of the committee, Mr. Adam Topp, Shared Health CEO, is unable to attend this evening. Instead, uh, Ms. Janice Grift, Diagnostic Imaging Program, Shared Health is here as a witness. Is there leave of the committee to allow Ms. Grift to speak on the record if required? Agreed. Leave has been granted. Does the Auditor General wish to make an opening statement? The Auditor General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, before I start, I'd like to introduce the staff I have with me here today. I have Stacy Wochuk, Assistant Auditor General of Performance Audit, and Melissa Emsley, Director of Performance Audit, and the lead on this audit. Mr. Chair, MRI scans help clinicians diagnose, monitor, and treat patients' medical conditions. Delays in receiving an MRI scan can lead to delays in definitive diagnosis and appropriate treatment. And excessive wait times can increase patient anxiety and negatively impact quality of life. In June 2016, there were 21,323 people waiting for an MRI with an average wait of 23 weeks. At the time of our audit, <clears throat> uh, we examined the management of MRI services by the Department of Health, Diagnostic Services Manitoba, Perry Mountain Health, and the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Specifically, we examined the adequacy of the processes for ensuring timely and efficient MRI services and patient safety and quality of MRI scans and reports. With, <clears throat> with respect to intake processes for MRIs, we found, oh, sorry. With respect to intake processes for MRI requests, we found that there were limited processes to prevent inappropriate MRI requests. This is despite evidence that 10 to 20% of medical imaging exams are unnecessary. We also found many duplicate MRI requests occur. In addition, wait times were imbalanced across the country. As of June 2016, the average wait time in Winnipeg was as long as 27 weeks, while the average wait time in Brandon was 12 weeks. With respect to prioritizing requests and meeting related targets, we found that targets were often not met and some patients were given priority for non-medical reasons. These patients included Workers' Compensation Board clients at one WRHA facility due to an agreement between this facility and the WCB. Patients covered by private insurers such as professional athletes. And some patients with influence such as government officials, donors, and people waiting in the health, people working in the healthcare system. 
We also found that facilities did not track MRI wait times by assigned priority level. For the output patient files examined, the audit found that only 42% of urgent scans, 24% of semi-urgent scans, and 12% of routine scans were scheduled when the, within the target wait time. With respect to making efficient use of MRI scanners, we found that scanners were not fully and efficiently used. The hours of operation for scanners in June 2016 ranged from 48 to 117 hours weekly. We estimated that nearly 11,300 more scans could be done annually if all 11 scanners ran 16 hours a day uh, for every day of the week. We also found that differing scanner protocol and scheduling practices were impacting the number of scans done per day. In addition, scanner productivity was inadequately monitored and more could be done to reduce the estimated 3,400 no-shows that occur annually. With respect to reporting MRI results, we found that while radiologist reports were generally prepared quickly after scans were done, we found some exceptions. This showed a need for better monitoring to flag any exceptions. With respect to planning and performance reporting, we found that there was insufficient information for decisions on, on additional scanners. Uh, performance information was inconsistent and incomplete, and the information publicly reported needed improvement. With respect to patient safety and quality assurance processes, we found that some patient screening forms were incomplete, facilities uh, were accredited, but the annual medical physics review were not done, and peer review quality assurance processes were lacking. The report included 24 recommendations. At the time of our final follow-up in September 2020, only six of the 24 recommendations were fully uh, implemented. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Does the Deputy Minister, Ms. Hurd, wish to make an opening statement and would they please introduce their staff joining them here today? Yes, I would like to. I'm joined today by Dr. Marco Essig, Provincial Clinical Specialty Lead for Diagnostic Imaging, and by John French, Executive Director, Provincial Diagnostic Imaging for Shared Health, and Janice Grift, Manager of Diagnostic Imaging Quality and Process Improvement for Shared Health. MRI scans use a magnetic field and pulses of radio wave energy to make picture of organs and structures inside the body. In some cases, a contrast material, dye, may be injected to show images of organs or structures more clearly. Manitoba has 14 MRIs located throughout the province in Winnipeg, Selkirk, Brandon, Dauphin, and at Boundary Trails Health Centre by Morden Winkler. Previously, Manitoba had MRI management split amongst Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, Prairie Mountain Health, and Diagnostic Services of Manitoba. Since the establishment of the Provincial Health Authority called Shared Health, MRI management of all sites has been consolidated into one organization, thus enabling better standardization and coordination of processes and procedures. Manitoba Health and Shared Health are committed to ensuring patient-centered, safe and quality care in diagnostic imaging. Continuous quality improvement is imperative to ensure that we continue to meet the needs of individuals and adapt to ever evolving medical evidence. When the audit was conducted in 2017, the shift of management to one organization had not yet fully occurred. There were 24 recommendations, but because many were directed to more than one organization, it was identified as 52 recommendations across all sites, spanning six areas. Intake of requests for MRI, prioritization of MRI requests, ensuring MRI scanners are fully and efficiently used, reporting MRI scan results, MRI planning and performance reporting, and patient safety and MRI quality assurance processes. 
this shift to shared health diagnostics has enabled more consistency in implementing these important recommendations. The first follow-up occurred in March 2019, second in 2020, and third in March 2021. While the pandemic has definitely impacted progress and momentum of rollout of the implementation re uh, related to the recommendations, we do feel that uh, we are close to completing many of the recommendations that remain outstanding within the last follow-up. Considerable work continues in order to further strengthen and improve the rigor of processes and succeed in full implementation of the recommendations. So thank you for providing us the opportunity tonight to share our progress to date and plan next steps on the audit. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to inform those who are new to this uh, committee of the process that's undertaken with regard to outstanding questions. At the end of every meeting, the research officer reviews the Hansard for any outstanding questions that the witness commits to provide an answer to and will draft a questions pending response document to send to the deputy minister. Upon receipt of the answers to these questions, the research officer then forwards the responses to every PAC member and to every other member recorded as attending that meeting. Um, before we get into questions, I'd like to remind members the questions of an administrative nature are placed to the witnesses. The questions uh, will not be entertained um, if they're uh, of a policy uh, nature. The floor is now open for questions. Mr. Lindsay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so we've heard now that, that shared health is is the sole entity for, for doing a lot of this stuff with MRI. So could you give us the status of the implementation, implementation of recommendations from the management of MRI services report? How many have actually been completed and what's the status of the remaining recommendations? Deputy Minister. Okay, this is uh, fairly lengthy, um, but in terms of the um, audit items that were identified as work in progress at the last audit uh, follow-up, March 31st, 2021, uh, we can advise that on recommendation 15, um, shared health, working with all the different locations that um, have MRIs in the province, have, um, through the establishment of shared health, has a responsibility for provincial clinical and preventive service planning for the health system, including the planning and operation of the province-wide diagnostic imaging program. So Shared Health uh, continues now to monitor actual uh, daily progress against target uh, to see where there are areas of MRI operations in the province that require some additional focus and attention. So that's recommendation 15. For recommendation 17, in terms of new additional MRI scanners. Uh, again, we have the provincial uh, clinical and preventive service planning process that identifies uh, where clinical services will best be configured in the province. And as a result, then shared health um, a diagnostic imaging program can make the best decisions about where additional MRI scanners should be. And so, um, in the most recent version of the Clinical and Preventive Service Plan, they've begun to identify that sites identified as intermediate hubs and, um, and uh, full acute tertiary hubs should be locations where there are MRIs in place on a go forward. Recommendation number 20, that the department enhance public information on MRI wait times and volumes. Uh, this is an item that's actively underway. 
There's um, been work done with the new technology solution that's been implemented within uh, shared health to ensure that we can begin to report wait times more consistent with national definitions through the uh, Center for Health Information. And um, work is actively underway with the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force to ensure that we begin to uh, report in more consistent national ways. Recommendation number four uh, related to uh, the length of time taking to book MRI appointments and promptly remedy any significant booking backlogs. Uh, this has now been implemented by Shared Health. A new report has been implemented and ongoing work with all sites related to workflow is happening. Recommendation number nine, um, in terms of assigning priority codes to all MRI uh, scan requests, Shared Health uh, advises that uh, WCB cases are dealt with in accordance to standard practice across other provincial jurisdictions and that these cases are imaged outside of normal operating hours and parameters from 4 to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and 12.30 to 2 p.m. on weekends. WCB provides one week notice of any unfilled slots, which are then utilized for routine cases. Additionally, athletes requiring scans are dealt with in accordance with standard prioritization practices. Uh, recommendation number 10, uh, in terms of uh, monitoring and tracking wait times by priority level and uh, adjusting scheduling. Uh, Shared Health has identified that this is uh, done through ongoing monitoring and improvement uh, in terms of the ever-evolving uh, way that um, efficiencies in the use of the MRI are monitored. The alignment in shared health has helped to have um, consistent practices in place at all um, sites that have an MRI in place across the province. Recommendation number 12 in terms of um, identifying and implementing facility scheduling practices, uh, shared health advised that um, they have uh, participated in workshops to identify best practices in MRI scheduling and that um, they use ongoing monitoring and improvement to ensure that slate or, uh, spots for MRI appointments are used as effectively as possible. Um, item 13, the recommendation about reducing no-show right, uh, no show rates. Um, the dynamic is slightly different in rural Manitoba than Winnipeg. It's, it's a much more complex thing to ensure that uh, no-shows, uh, those spots can be used in rural Manitoba. Uh, of course, it's a little bit easier in Winnipeg where people can get to different MRI sites a little more easily. Uh, so Shared Health advised that they have been using overbooking in a way to ensure that uh, we deal with the cancellations that um, just innately will occur. Uh, recommendation number 16 in terms of MRI report turnaround times. There is always evolving evidence on this item, so Shared Health Diagnostic Imaging will always be assessing how the operations need to evolve and evolving uh, those appropriately. In terms of recommendation 21, um, patient safety screening forms. Uh, the form has been developed. It's in the approval process and then uh, the development of the process to perform audits on this uh, needs to be established. Recommendation number 23, we believe that this has been completed. This is the um, 
recommendation to have a medical physicist assess the MRI quality control programs each year as required by MANCAP, the Manitoba Quality Assurance Program Standards. Recommendation 24, um, peer reviews for MRI uh, technologists. Uh, Shared Health has implemented the recommendation 24A, um, but we had not um, proceeded with the Diagnostic Imaging Peer Learning Organization across Manitoba rollout, but now post-pandemic we can move uh, forward with this. Um, Again, the recommendations that were individually in that last follow-up report directed to Prairie Mountain Health and to um, WRHA, uh, we can say that they are all being addressed through shared health processes. Uh, recommendation number one, which was directed to multiple organizations working together, uh, the department, DSM, PMH, and WRHA working together and collaboratively with Choosing Wisely Manitoba and other stakeholders develop specific initiatives to improve the appropriateness of MRI requests. Uh, this is an ever-evolving um, issue. There's always evidence um, that emerges over time about uh, appropriateness of MRI scans. And uh, so this will always be ongoing work guided by evidence, but Shared Health advised that they are working closely on the Choosing Wisely initiatives that emerge in this field. On recommendation number eight, which was again directed to multiple organizations to develop a single province-wide method of prioritizing MRI requests that include a de clear definition and standard wait time target for each priority level, at minimum meeting the Canadian Association of Radiologists guidelines. Uh, so Shared Health advised that all but one site use these CAR definitions. Pan Am has slightly modified the definitions to meet their needs, and this is ongoing work. Uh, recommendation number 11, uh, working together to harmonize MRI scan protocols across all facilities in the province and uh, adjust the standard length of scan appointments to reflect any resulting time savings. This is a very significant recommendation that in, in my view will have to be chunked out uh, so that it could be accomplished. So right now a certain number of protocols are currently identified uh, yeah, by I Shared know. Health for harmonization. Uh, recommendation 19, that the department work collaboratively with, uh, with the various organizations to uh, review and clarify how it expects MRI scan volumes and wait times to be calculated. Uh, Excuse me, will... I have to interrupt. I'm sorry, sorry we have a, a time oh, limit of sorry. 10 minutes, so we're going to ask Mr. Lindsay to re-ask the question, so it will give you another 10 minutes. Mr. Lindsay. Uh, thank you. If you could uh, carry on with the answer to my first question, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Minister. Okay. Uh, I think we just have one more. Sorry. Uh, so recommendation number 19, that the department will work collaboratively uh, to review and clarify how it expects MRI scan volumes and wait times to be calculated and reported. Um, so this, the IT systems that are in place now allow us to move in the direction of uh, reporting wait times more consistent with how CIHI, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, defines them. Um, and we will work closely with the um, Shared Health Organization, the regional health authorities, and the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force to uh, focus on provision of the information that's most important to the public first in terms of uh, wait times. So that work is uh, currently underway, and we will be um, able to report more consistently with the national definitions uh, due to the implementation of the um, new IT system. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm going to rec recognize Mr. Lindsay for a second real question, if he has one. If not, we go to Mr. Michaleski. Go to Mr. Michaleski. Mr. Michaleski. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank uh, everybody for, for attending and uh, coming to answer these questions on this, on this MRI report. Uh, just to give some context to this, uh, if I reflect back to 2017, I think this was the first Auditor General report that I read uh, after being elected. And of course, we had a history and often of an MRI that took a very, very long time to get there. And I think I said at the last meeting, and I don't want to be, uh, uh, but I need to put this in context so I, I can ask, answer the question. We were 12th or 13th of 14 in the province. I would say our region uh, and north, uh, really north of the, of the Trans-Canada Highway, they uh, lived without MRI services for a long time. They experienced a tremendous, uh, disruption uh, when there was a significant amount of M MRIs uh, south of Man in southern Manitoba. Of course, this was not just a, didn't seem to make a lot of sense uh, why there wasn't better locations uh, selected for MRIs earlier on. Uh, but that having said that, uh, you know, we can always still make changes to what's uh, on the ground now. And that's partly what my question's about. Uh, we see the MRIs are more in demand now. I don't, uh, I guess I have one question. Are they becoming more mainstream? Are they becoming more mandatory um, than they were 10 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago, they, I wouldn't say they were a novelty, but there was new technology, um, you know, but now they seem to be more mainstream. They're more asked. So um, am I correct in assuming that MRI services are becoming a pretty critical diagnostic um, tool for across the province. And again, just the way the, the layout of the MRIs are now, it may not be the easiest thing to change the location of them now, but I do think that there's some logic to really studying where those MRIs are located or need to be located. So I would, uh, then I would ask, um, now we've shifted over to the shared health model. What, um, what does the future look like? Are we looking at um, just, for instance, uh, a regional uh, qualifier, I guess, for the MRI services the province does versus uh, right now, let's just say there's a concentration of 10 in the city of Winnipeg. Now, does, does part of those ones in Winnipeg shift over to some other type of service, private perhaps, uh, while the province moves the MRIs throughout the province? Is that what, we're, what it's going to look like? Because somewhere along the line, there's a provincial responsibility to provide the MRI services, and that's not there right now. Uh, to have them in a better location in the province. So I guess I, my question is, you know, what's in the, what's in the window uh, when in terms of MRIs planning in the future with shared health? And of course, there's new technology coming in MRIs as well that might change that landscape too. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but I want to be clear that there's a real emphasis on regional MRI services here. And that's what I, that's my question is, is what's in the window here and what are we doing to ensure that that happens? Deputy Minister. Okay. Deputy Minister. Our uh, Manitoba's uh, clinical and preventive service plan does identify for clinical services the importance of aligning diagnostic services to uh, what the clinical services plan is and uh, specifically on page 79 of that that plan uh, it does identify that MRIs um, in terms of regional MRI hubs based on clinical programs, site location, and volumes. That's really the planning parameters 
uh, at a regional level and that regional MRI hubs are also placed in provincial high acuity specialty medical and surgical care sites, again, based on clinical programs, site location and volumes. Um, but to your other question on uh, clinical need and appropriateness, I thought perhaps Dr. Right. Essig could uh, provide further on that. Yeah. Doctor? Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and just a little bit of background. I work in MRI since 1991, so I had, it was established in 89, so I was at the very beginning when MRI was established. And uh, it's uh, evolving over time, of course, like the indications have grown, uh, the indications have shifted, so we have seen areas, diseases where we shift from CT to MRI or from X-ray to MRI, but we also have seen other areas are shifting from MRI uh, to other diagnostics. Um, so it's an, an uh, like continuously evolving um, uh, topic. However, like the trend is that uh, the demand for MRI has increased over time substantially. Um, like this is driven by an aging population in the Western world. Uh, it's driven by population growth, and it's uh, driven by change in management from a clinical point of view, not managed by radiologists. It's just that international guidelines on specific diseases now request to do an MRI instead of a CT or instead of an X-ray. Uh, that is driving that demand as well. On the other side, in the past, uh, like certain population groups were not able to get an MRI because there were contraindications or the scan was taken too long. So when I started in 1991, a typical MRI uh, time was between one hour and one and a half hours. The patient is in, in the scanner and trying to hold still. Of course, uh, there's a certain group in the population that cannot do that, especially very sick patients or patients with uh, movement disorders. So that has changed. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, but now a scan is done in between 15 and 20 minutes, up to an hour, of course, uh, depending on what kind of an indication uh, we have. So in general, we do see a trend that uh, the demand for MRI is continuously growing and with shared health and combining all the organizations that provide diagnostic imaging in the province, we now have also the tools and the possibility to monitor, like we do know what the, like the projected growth is. Uh, for in the future that would also help us to identify uh, the need for additional pieces of equipment. Um, and we have also with the provincial organization now the possibility going after the postal codes to really see on how patients in the province travel, where do they have their MRIs, where do they, uh, uh, from where are they coming, uh, what's their wait time, what's their uh, depending also on the locations where, where they are based from their home, from the postal code, which we can use. Um, and um, then um, there's uh, an always um, increasing, uh, not only demand uh, from a clinical point of view, but also from a technical point of view that we can apply MRI imaging to more people that we couldn't do in the past. So it's, it's a very, very dynamic process. Um, uh, but in general, like as an, like a summary, uh, the demand is growing. Mr. Mikuleski, for a second question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And yeah, just a follow-up. I appreciate uh, both the answers on this. Um, I guess you reckon in the shared health or the shared health report you're talking about, there's uh, it mentioned uh, about regional, but what guarantees? are there that that's actually going to be implemented? Um, because again, there's, if I go back to recommendation 17, there's a whole bunch of data coming into here to try to select uh, numbers, um, you know, in terms of location and, you know, how we're going to manage these things. Um, doctor, you mentioned the issue about that data maybe tied to location and that's part of the decision making. I would say to you, uh, when you're two to four hours away from an MRI machine, it's more important that you lay, locate one there than the efficiencies of the provincial, uh, than the efficiency of the MRI uh, operations provincially, because that doesn't really make any sense. 
you know, in, 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 in especially in Manitoba, where you have Winnipeg, which is in the far, far southeast corner uh, of the province. Like, it, it makes absolutely no sense to, you know, and argue that all MRI should be population-based, should be, should be down there. So there has to be a regional component that has been lacking across healthcare in a number of things, but MRI is, in particular, it stands out as something that really absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. So I would still need a, you know, I'd like to have, uh, some, just on the record anyway, just that regional is absolutely important. And it's just, it simply can't uh, ignore that, uh, you know, and just use population or some other data to sort of say, well, okay, now they should all be done in Brandon or they should all be in Portage, right? Because that makes no sense. So I would say, again, the location uh, then to me is, uh, is sort of a first checkbox, right? So we're going to make sure we do that and then the other governing things will follow after that, right? But we're, for sure, we're going to make sure we do these, these, these things. But I guess my question then, um, again, MRI technology is changing, and you've, and you've, and you've acknowledged that. And um, so I'm going to go back to my original question, which talked about uh, the provincial responsibilities and if there's a... Um, can you give me some sort of uh, background or example of some place where MRIs have gone uh, to whether it's a combination of public private like how is that would that how would that improve or is that a, is that a, is that a part that that's part of the solution to the way the MRIs are sort of lined up in Manitoba right now versus how they should be like is that private aspect play big into that. In terms of um, private MRIs, when we've had discussions with, um, with other provinces and those private providers, what they identify is that it needs to be a long-term commitment for them to go through the large capital investment of um, putting a private MRI uh, business in place in the province. And so really in Manitoba to this point, uh, we have generally um, gone with the approach of a publicly supported system, although we know that some other jurisdictions have more of a mix. I'd say at the current time, we don't even have MRIs in every, um, every part of the province that has a hub or an intermediate hub emergency department and healthcare facility. So we haven't really even uh, gotten to that sort of coverage yet. Um, Right now, the sites that are intermediate and uh, district hubs that we have put MRIs in in the public system are at Selkirk, um, Dauphin, Boundary Trails, and in terms of intermediate sites, Brandon, and of course, the sites in Winnipeg. So um, there is more to do in terms of assessing where uh, new MRIs might go, and um, right now I can say on the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force, um, they're having these very sorts of discussions about, um, in terms of dealing with some of the backlog arising from the pandemic, what sort of model uh, would be best place to address those backlogs. So that's an ongoing discussion at the moment. Ms. Naylor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, folks, for being here tonight to answer our questions. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, more towards the quality control aspect of things. Um, I'm really interested in recommendation 24 that talks about um, 
regular, like complete, completing all required peer reviews for MRI technologists, and Part B, implementing a formal and documented annual peer review process for radiologists that includes assessing how they prioritize read and interpret MRI scans. Um, I noted that you said that that was um, something that was not yet complete, but getting closer perhaps. I'm really conscious of the fact that, that this, you know, at 2020, at the three, after three year review, this was a, a totally incomplete recommendation. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk to us about what some of the barriers have been and when we can expect to, to see these um, peer review processes in place. Thank you. The Deputy Minister. Uh, Dr. Essig would like to answer. Oh, doctor? Yeah, so I, I can answer that because uh, peer review is a big topic of mine. Um, and um, so when that um, uh, audit was done, there were uh, very few jurisdictions in Canada that had implemented a peer review process for radiologists. Uh, now in 2022, they all have gone a different direction. They all have canceled their peer review processes and went to a, uh, like a theme which is called peer learning. Because peer review uh, is challenging because it's seen punitive and you would not engage individuals in a, in a process that they think it's punitive. So everyone has actually gone, um, there's still a review process but it's not really a peer review on a regular basis. It's uh, also taking into account that like there's other information where you can identify quality uh, issues which are not uh, part of a peer review process. Peer review, just to give an overview, let's say you do a thousand exams and randomly a certain percentage, one or two percent are selected and they are reviewed again. So it's like you're looking for the needle in the haystack in a way. Um, and of course you can identify that people are underperforming, but there's way more other ways to identify by having an open peer learning uh, environment, which is not punitive, where people are allowed to step on uh, and, and step forward and say, okay, there's a, an underperforming person. Um, and that all flows into a, like a central uh, organization that looks into um, uh, that learning like taking these cases not to investigate but to learn. Of course you investigate them but, but you use them as a learning opportunity. They are shared amongst the larger group and nobody that is involved has to fear that there's like uh, punitive ways. Um, of course there's then critical incidents which are totally different but they're also integrated into here. Um, so um, again there's an involvement uh, of the way on how we uh, assess those. Uh, away from a peer learning, a structured peer learning process uh, to a, uh, like a peer review process to a peer learning uh, environment. And we have started that. I have created a document uh, which is called Diploma Diagnostic Imaging Peer Learning uh, within Manitoba, which describes and outlines all these activities that we are doing and how we identify performance issues. Uh, it's predominantly made for radiologists right now. Uh, but of course, um, in uh, the uh, field of technologists, it's going the same way. So there's a review process uh, involved, um, and there's also measures if someone is really identified to underperform, that this individual can be taken out and be trained and uh, be uh, mentored uh, to improve in the quality. I'm going to make this a two-part follow-up so I can ask two things. <laughs> so the one follow-up question is, uh, you've indicated that this is process has begun, so I'm interested in knowing um, when this will be fully implemented across the system, the peer learning review that you've spoken about. And through this new process that you've implemented, what percentage of MRI readings would you know annually be review to, to make sure that they were accurate and being done properly. Yeah, that's, um, Doctor? 
Uh, I can answer the first uh, question fairly easy. Like the document uh, was produced uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And you can imagine that there were a, a few other things that were more important in the last two years. Uh, but of course, we are still reviewing and we have started to, to look into that again. Um, coming back to your second part, um, like in a standardized peer review process, like there's different kind of methodologies on what's the percentage of uh, cases that you review on a regular basis. Um, in a peer learning, it's very hard to define because like I was on MRI service the day, I probably did peer review or peer learning in more than half of my cases, more than 50%. Because I look at the prior exam, I identify whether there was a discrepancy with the current exam. So that's a, it's kind of a review, a review that we are using for learning that. Um, it's not standardized, but uh, like we are now creating that um, environment where we can flag those cases and they're going into a learning uh, or they're going into a review, depending on what kind of a finding it is. So with a peer, and we are actually covering more. It's not like just uh, ignoring 97% and only reviewing uh, 3%. Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, Ms. Hurd and your colleagues there. Um, my question is about uh, how can Manitobans feel confident that they're getting an MRI as quickly and as close to home as possible? I think we all know that delays in getting an MRI scan can uh, lead to delays in diagnosis and treatment for patients here in Manitoba. So I, can you just lead me through the process? Once I visit a physician and a physician requests an MRI, where does that request go to? Is it regional? Is it provincial? How and where are they prioritized? Is it based on medical need? Um, what, um, what type of uh, protocol is applied there? And also expand on how overbooking works and what happens if everyone shows up? It's something like getting on an airplane, right? They tend to overbook. And, uh, but if everybody shows up, I've often wondered what happens. So, thank you. Yeah. Doctor? Yeah. So, um, we have to differentiate here on how urgent this scan is. So if there's an urgent or emergent scan, uh, physicians can send um, the requisition right to the site. So for example, if a patient is in the emergency department at any hospital, they send the requisition directly uh, into the department. Um, the um, requisition is reviewed by a radiologist. The radiologist uh, double checks the urgency often phones the physician back, or there's even a phone call before they send the requisition. Um, and then a protocol is established and the scan is done. For emergent scans, that's normally done within 24 hours, often even faster. Um, so that's urgent ones. Um, there are certain urgent ones that have to change the location. So for example, if I have a, a scan that is uh, like an urgent patient in boundary trails, but they don't have that technology to answer the question, um, then the scan will be done at a different site, in, uh, at, uh, like HSC or St. Boniface, uh, because the scanners are different. Like we are talking about, and I take the analogy of a car, like we are running like very simple cars and we are running high-end cars. And of course they perform different. Um, and so there are certain scanners that, like certain questions that can only answered at a certain site and then the patient has to be transferred. The same is true if uh, the patient needs immediate follow-up from the discussion and there's no physician, no surgeon that can operate on that patient, it often makes sense to transfer the patient to be seen by a specialist and to do the scan at the same time. Uh, that's in the emergent and like super urgent um, kind of um, environment. Uh, urgent ones are normally um, then sent also to the site itself because there's also a certain turnaround time. Everything that is elective or considered elective, depending on the, um, um, on the discussion, uh, goes to a central intake process. Um, on that requisition, the uh, referring physician can indicate whether they would like to see the patient at a certain site. There's a field where you can fill in like I want to have that patient scanned at Pan Am because I know that's where the experts for that questions are. 
Um, and that central intake process, uh, the, the requisitions are reviewed by clerks, by um, specialists that are not physicians, uh, but um, like uh, clerks that are specialized coming out of the profession um, that review those and then indicate what is the best site to go to uh, if it's not specified, um, as well as uh, distributing them a lot amongst the, the wait time, the different wait times um, and so on. Um, and then the requisition comes and every morning if I go into the office I find a stack of those uh, requisitions and I fill them out, I give them a priority based on the clinical information that is provided. I also have the ability to say no, this is an indication which would rather go to a different technique, not an MRI but a, a CT. And then the requisition goes back to the booking clerk at the site and they book them into, uh, into a schedule. That's like in a nutshell on how, how the process works. So it's very different for emergent and urgent than for elective uh, patients. And of course we have patients that have an MRI for a regular follow-up, for example a cancer patient that needs a, like every six months a follow-up MRI. Uh, we try to do them always at the same site so that they get the, the same quality. And of course, also in, in our organization, we would like to have the patient get the same quality independent where they go. Because patients might end up at one time at one side and the next follow-up is at another side. And I need to, from a medical perspective, make sure I want to have it, uh, the best that they uh, receive the same quality independent where they are going. Of course, this is challenging, and that was also discussed in the, um, in the audit, that we are not running all on the same platform. It's not that we have all the same machines. They are very different. They are different vintages. Some of them are 10 plus years old. Others are brand new. And of course, with that very fast evolving technology, you cannot compare an old Chevy car with a high-end uh, race car. Like, that's just uh, not possible. But that's kind of how, how it or it, it's organized. Mr. Nersbitt. Um, so we often hear of diagnostic wait times now. Can you give me an average wait time for an elective MRI in Manitoba? And does it vary by site? Or is there a provincial average or a site averages for each of them? The Deputy Minister. Okay, so right now uh, we do have these on our Manitoba Health website. Uh, so right now the wait time Manitoba average uh, as at March 2022 is uh, 24 weeks. That's the Manitoba average. Uh, we do identify the wait by individual um, MRI on that website as well. Um, I did allude to earlier, though, that we um, are just in the process of re-examining how we calculate uh, wait times to be more consistent with the national definition of wait time. So we do anticipate that there will be some changes to how we're reporting. But of course, we want to make sure that we're going through a proper process of outlining how those changes are coming about and what the cause of them are. We, we want to be transparent about that. Um, so right now on the, wait, on the website, it's showing as an average wait of 24 weeks. Mr. Levant. Thank you very much, and yeah, and, and hello. I just had, I had a couple of questions to follow up on. Um, uh, it was a couple of the recommendations, and I'll try to talk about two of them. I think one was at number 12, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was that the WRHA identify and implement facility uh, scheduling practices that can increase the number of MRIs, that the WRHA participated in workshops, um, but I mean workshops aren't implementation, so what, what would be the timeline on, on the implementation uh, following from those workshops? And the other was number 21, that the, the WRHA implement processes to ensure patient safety screening forms are fully completed and properly signed. And if I'm correct, you said that that's in approval at Shared Health, but it has been previously previously done. Uh, they said the WRHA developed and approved an audit form for use and that it advised that a committee had been struck to determine the process to conduct audits. So just on those two, uh, two questions, have, uh, have 
there been implementation? Is there a timeline for implementation from the workshops uh, about facility scheduling practices? And then for the uh, the safety screening forms, uh, just where that's at, and if the WRHA had already approved it, uh, are we in a in position where shared health is uh, is has sort of backslid, so to speak? Deputy Minister. We'd like uh, Janice Griff to answer that. Okay, Ms. Griff. Okay, so in terms of the scheduling, there are a couple of things. One, it relates to the protocol harmonization, which is another one of the recommendations. So in order for the schedules to be the same, the protocols have to be the same. And so we're reliant on that piece, which we've identified a number of routine protocols that we can standardize. We're waiting for that approval. The, there has been a lot of turnover in terms of our booking clerks, and so that it takes quite a bit to, to train them on, on in terms of the booking processes and that kind of thing. So I'm hopeful that we can when impl implement at least some of those protocols within the year. It's a challenge, certainly, with, with the changing staff. The other question was related to... Oh, safety, safety screening, yes, sorry. So it had, because there were three previous organizations that were, were audited, the WRHA had approved and implemented something, but then when we all fell under shared health, we had to make sure, that that's one of the challenges is trying to have standard practices across all of the sites in, in the province. So we continued with the WRHA sites, but we haven't quite implemented at the rural sites. We have educated the charge technologists to keep an eye on the screening forms because of, of how important they are. So the education is there, and next is just implementing the audit form provincially. Okay. Mr. Lamont? Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Um, just so to follow up, I mean, like if, this, if one of the, it says it, it's basically a bottleneck that you're facing with, um, with staff turnover, what would be the reason for the staff? I mean, look, there's been a pandemic. We all know that. What would be the reason for staff turnover? Is it, if you can address that in any, any way, what, what has been the challenge around retention or staff turnover? Because I mean, if that were to be addressed, you might be able to you might be able to do this. Uh, it might be easier to to to, to make this happen. Ms. Grift. Um, okay, so we've, we've a couple of things. We've had quite a number of unexpected retirements over the last few years, or the last two years, I guess, because of the pandemic. Just, I'll be honest, it's been overwhelming um, at, at the front lines and, and dealing with the additional pressures and stresses, not only of the pandemic, but also of just the transformation and changes. Um, these are, you know, you're, you're lower level clerical staff and so they're finding jobs that are a little bit easier and, and less pressure so we do have some key people that are, are amazing and have stuck around but they can only do so much so i think it's just attracting people back into the healthcare uh, system at, at this level mr martin thank you very much mr chair i'm, I'm interested in in the uh, recommendation for reducing no shows in in particular uh, in the original audit report, it noted that, unfortunately, in some instances, no-shows were filled with persons of influence, so politicians, athletes, or, or large donors. I, I see in the OAG comment that the WRHA uh, has uh, participated in a pilot project to evaluate an automatic appointment reminder software. So I'm wondering if you can just walk me through that pilot program, when it occurred, how widespread it was, and, and the, the results of the pilot project whether the pilot project has concluded uh, and, and whether or not it's going to be expanded upon. And I'm just thinking that my, my daughter just quickly has an orthodontic appointment tomorrow. I've already got a text, you know, two texts reminding me of that from, from that clinic. So. Ms. Griff. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, okay. So the pilot was done in, oh boy, I, I want to say 2019. Uh, there was a number of sites within Winnipeg as well as Brandon. So we did HSC and the GRACE MRI as well as Brandon. 
It was um, moderately successful because, because it was a pilot, we couldn't integrate the software with our RIS, which would mean it, which would make it a much more robust system. We did have privacy issues because of the fact that we can't say you have a specific appointment at a site because of privacy issues. So there were a number of things that we had to, hoops we had to jump through. The pilot was concluded, and as I said, because we couldn't integrate with our software, there were challenges. So if we were to move forward with an integrated program, I feel it would be a much better solution. Right now, we have, um, we have it's on our radar, but we haven't been able to implement it further because we don't have the funding to implement it. Mr. Martin. <clears throat> Another comment that, that I believe the Deputy Minister made was about 10 to 20 percent of MRIs are, aren't required or medically required. I'm wondering if you can expand a bit on that as, as to what's driving it. Is it, it patient-driven or is it doctor-driven? And more importantly, how or can it be a, a addressed? Doctor? Uh, yeah. So just probably one little step back like what you said before about the no-shows there's different kind of no-shows it's patients that forget their appointment uh, or are just stuck in traffic whatever but there's also a fair number of patients that even they undergo a screening procedure and that addresses the other question there's no patient that goes into the scanner that had not a safety screening that's just impossible that will never happen uh, but then during the uh, um, screening procedure, they recognize that the patient has a contraindication for the MRI. They can't go. And these informations, uh, we don't have them hours before. So there's certain times that like, just the patient is not able to do it, and then we have a spot available for half an hour. So there's no patients walking around or sitting around that just wait for that to happen. Uh, that's why we are overbooking. And uh, to answer your question, uh, what happens if everybody shows up, we just work longer. That's just the, that's the uh, simple answer. Uh, we produce overtime for our technologists uh, at those sites. Um, uh, and in respect of the appropriateness, like appropriateness is a very difficult topic to discuss about because uh, like if you ask 10 people, you will get 10 different answers what is appropriate or what is not. Um, there are certain uh, things that have been proven, like through choosing wisely, for example, uh, that certain indications, let's say an MRI of the knee at a certain age, um, uh, would not be appropriate. But in, if you ask the referring physician, he says, yeah, but this patient, like, I think it's appropriate. Um, and then I need to have that discussion with him that I think it's not appropriate. And th this is an interesting discussion uh, that we have to do actually every day. Uh, but there are certain recommendations, and we are working on those. So we have implemented uh, appropriateness measures uh, that uh, physicians have to fill out before they request an MRI of low back pain. They have to fill out a form which clearly indicates why this patient needs it. Um, and uh, we are working on a project right now on, on knees. Uh, or other uh, MRI-specific uh, indications where we know that there's a number of, um, um, of uh, indications that are not fully appropriate. But of course, it very much dependent, it's very much dependent, as everything in medicine, very individual in, uh, like, um, uh, dependent. Um, so that number of 20%, I think it's fairly high. Um, and also, we need to uh, see that most of those uh, appropriateness criteria, they are calculated retrospective. So if you tell me that this is not appropriate uh, for that patient, but this individual patient now has a pathology that I miss and he's improperly treated or not treated uh, at all, it might be, from a general view, uh, inappropriate, but I only know in retrospect. Mr. Lindsay. <clears throat> so I've heard you talk about the clinical services plan and, and how you're going to, through that, decide where other MRIs should be located. And you talked about some of the interlake communities and southern communities. What I didn't hear you say anywhere was that there was any consideration for anything happening in northern Manitoba. Now, recognizing that perhaps just placing one in northern Manitoba 
still leaves vast parts of, of the north without service simply because transportation, I mean, you talk about somebody driving from Brandon to Winnipeg, it's a couple of hours as opposed to eight hours on a good day to drive from communities in the north and in some cases it's 14, 15 hours. Even if you said, well, we're gonna put one in, in one community in the north, it still leaves so many communities with people with no way to access that. There isn't flights between them, there isn't bus service. So what's the plan for how are we going to address providing some level of service for people in northern Manitoba? Deputy Minister. It's a great point you're making. And within the clinical and preventive services plan, there is a recommendation about planning for an intermediate hub in the north. It didn't specify location uh, because of the vast um, distances as you've identified. And so um, in order to ensure there are intermediate level services, um, in the north, so that's akin to something like a Brandon Hospital would provide. Uh, there is a recommendation from that clinical plan that we need to go through a co-planning exercise with uh, residents in the north, uh, including First Nations groups, to identify what uh, a northern intermediate hub looks like. Is it one site? Is it multiple sites? And from that clinical plan is where the um, both the health human resource and the infrastructure plan would flow from. So uh, the discussion is um, a live one in terms of where and what the intermediate hub in the north will look like and what the um, infrastructure requirements will be to support that in the north. So it, it is definitely a recommendation of the clinical plan. Mr. Lindsay. So I, I hear you talking about a site in the north, and as I've just explained, a site in the north may not make it any more accessible for a goodly portion of the population in the north than, than having a site in Winnipeg simply because of the, the way to get folks from point A to point B. So uh, one would hope then that, particularly looking at the north, that the, the plan may evolve into something more than just one site. Uh, certainly when you look at things like portable MRIs that have been around for quite a number of years now and have probably proven their worth elsewhere that there's all kinds of other possibilities, perhaps, that, that you should be looking at, or I would hope you're looking at when it comes to, to sites, plural, in the north. The other question I have about, uh, specific to the north, but may very well be applicable to other regions, is when we talk about missed appointments, is there any tracking system that shows why some of those appointments have been missed? Uh, is it because of missed flights, missed bus service, inability to, to actually get from the north to wherever the MRI has been scheduled for, weather conditions and all of those kind of things? Is there a tracking system that covers all of those off so that then you start building the case why there needs to be MRIs in other locations, particularly the north. Doctor? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, we follow up on every patient that is um, not showing up to see why they are not showing up um, and also even more patients that are coming delayed, specifically if they're coming from the north or from outside of Winnipeg or they have to transfer from site A to B, um, then uh, like they are still accommodated uh, to a later time point and we rejuggle our, our schedule during the day. Um, 
like there's um, so many reasons. Of course, we know why a patient didn't come. Um, whether there is a tracking system where it's really like that, I, I, I'd like out, like, I can't tell you like so many percentage it was because of weather or because of uh, uh, transport or whatever. That I can't answer, but, uh, but we follow up with every patient that doesn't show up. Mr. Smoke. Thank you for attending tonight's committee. And some of my questions have been partially answered, but I'd just like to go on the scanners being fully and efficiently utilized. Uh, I know that uh, shared health is in, in its infancy, and that's the, one of the directions that shared health has to make sure that they get utilized. I'm just wondering if there's any type of, of numbers, like you know, it says that the machines are running at about 16 hours a day. I don't know how many scans that would give you, but how many scans are, are, are done in a day, and are there a number, whether it be 10% or 8% or 2% that don't get used because of no-shows or, or whatever else is happening. And it, just going from a, an issue that I had a few months back where I had an MRI and I got my letter stating when I'd have, when I was scheduled, and that was quite a few months in advance. And then about two weeks later, I get a phone call, you can come in, if you can come in next week, we can do you next week. And I asked, why is it so fast? And they said, they can't get a hold of anybody. Nobody's returning their calls. Is that an issue with some of this scans and stuff? Or are we not being fully utilized or efficiently utilized because they're just not being, people aren't showing up? I know we've talked a bit about no-shows and that. And like, how severe of a problem is it? Like, are, are the machines running at 98% so really it isn't the problem? Or are they running at 70% and that's a big problem? Doctor? <laughs> It's again a very complex question. <laughs> um, in general, like looking at the landscape in Canada, uh, Manitoba runs their scanners at a high capacity overall, on average. But you need to see that, let's say, for example, the scanner in Dauphin does 2,000 exams a year. The scanner at Pan Am does 12,000 exams. So you can answer which one is the most efficient one. It, there's so many factors that uh, like depend on it's the the patient mix it's the location the catchment area of course in more rural mm -hmm. areas uh, an mri cannot run efficiently there's just not enough patients for that scanner and you cannot force patients traveling like let's say from the very south of the province into a northern mm -hmm. community to get the mri you can do it for an individual a few uh, but it, it needs to be a kind of a balance um, and that also uh, then uh, uh, answers or, or kind of partly answers the question um, how, um, how efficient we are doing. Uh, in general, like looking at the general landscape, we are running them at a higher rate than other provinces. Um, also, like MRI, we have 14 scanners, um, and they are, if they are all running 100%, uh, if one fails, you really have a problem because where should you send those patients? So uh, you can never run at 100%. That's unsafe for uh, the site um, and for, for, for the patient population. So we are running them very efficiently at a high percentage, but it really depends on what kind of a scanner, what's the location, what's the patient mix, and then, of course, uh, how is the staffing? That's another huge problem. Like, we only can run the scanner if we have staff to run the scanner. And like, especially during COVID and in the last couple of years, um, like there were times where we had not enough um, staff. And then you get an appointment in three months, um, and then suddenly uh, we, there's more staffing available uh, because there's less people sick. And then we open up um, schedules, like we open up weekends or we open up evenings. Uh, we even, uh, um, at certain times, had the scanners running overnight. So you could get an, at 2 a.m., you could get an MRI appointment. Um, and that really depends on what we have as a capacity. So we try from a system to uh, run as efficient as possible, uh, but it also very much depends on staffing. And if we have the staffing, of course, we open, we open up those shifts that are normally not filled because of staffing issues. Mr. Smoke. I think it answers my question. I would just I had that concern because when we look at all the number of uh, recommendations and stuff, 
how big of a problem it is, but obviously it's a problem, but it's not as, as critical as what it may seem. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Wasalu. I'm wondering if you could expand on uh, the staff vacancy issue, uh, because that's clearly a challenge that you're facing. What, what is the current vacancy rate? And if we were at full capacity, how many more you know, uh, tests could we get through the system? French. We have a vacancy rate of around 10% for MRI staff currently. However, the number of MRI staff that we have in the system is relatively small, so it's subject to a sudden and, and quite dramatic variation. Uh, as an example, we recently lost just a couple of staff from our site at Boundary Trails. Uh, and that led us to have to close down some shifts there because there's only about four staff that work there. Okay, so that's uh, that's a challenge that we have in highly specialised areas. We are working with the colleges to make sure that we can train the number of additional staff that we need to run the system effectively, uh, and we're trying actively to get more staff into the system. But it will continue to be a challenge while we have uh, a small number of specialized staff and some fairly long uh, lead times to train those staff. Mr. Wasselu. So you had indicated that the current sort of average wait time is 24 weeks. Um, I suspect that that's not best practices or what you would consider ideal. What would be the target wait time that a fully resourced, properly run system would find sort of as reasonable that that should be our target, that that's where we need to head. And how much more staff would you need to get there? Deputy Minister. Sorry, Dr. Essig would like to um, speak to the prioritization and then Mr. French to some of the staffing answer. Dr. Essig. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, wait times, um, and a lot was discussed in the report, and there's a, like a very current, um, and I'm a member of the task force. Um, discussion about the wait time, what is acceptable, where should we go, what would be the end goal. Like the, the good news is that like a patient that urgently needs an MRI, there is no wait time, period. Every patient that needs an urgent MRI in the province of Manitoba will get it within 24 hours, unless a site is down. That's like the, there's these very few exceptions. Uh, patients that uh, need an urgent MRI, and we are talking at, at the range between three days and seven days, they will get their MRI. There's no wait time for those patients either. Uh, the wait time is really for the elective patients. Uh, there is national targets that are set. Um, and of course, here we can compare us with other jurisdictions. And again, in those patients, even there's patients that 24 weeks doesn't really matter. But there's others in that same group where it matters, where it might have an impact. But we don't know that in advance. It's again like a retrospective analysis. And I would therefore uh, like ask uh, uh, Janice or uh, Mr. French uh, to answer about those national benchmarks because they have done all those calculations for us. Mr. French. So this, this is the second part of the question, I think, around the wait time standards uh, and also around our staffing requirements. So I, the, the recommended wait time for elective cases would be about 60 days or 8.5 weeks. Now I should qualify something about the wait times that were reported earlier in that they are not the average length for which patients wait. They are the average wait time for the next person to come onto the queue across the province. 
So many, many people wait less than that 24 weeks. So it's important to clarify that. In terms of our staffing requirements, through the work that we're doing with CPSP and through the waitlist task force and so on, we, we estimate that we probably need in the order of about 11 or 12 additional FTEs to drive down our waitlists. Uh, but the number of people that you need to achieve those FTEs would be more than that because, of course, you have to cover vacation relief, sick time and so on. So it's probably in the order of magnitude of about 15 to 16 uh, staff members additional that we need within the system. Mr. Teitzma. All right. Uh, thank you very much for, for being here. And, uh, and I thank uh, the member for, for that question because uh, he did get a couple of my, my points added, or asked and answered there around um, um, the emergent uh, and the urgent wait times. As well as uh, as maybe what uh, speak a little bit to the to the bottleneck, um, but if you could also just give us a sense of, you know, what percentage of of MRI scans are emergent, what percentage are urgent, what percentage are elective, and then I think you said there was a fourth category of kind of regularly scheduled or maybe that's the elective regularly scheduled cancer follow up and things. So a breakdown of those of those four. Would be would be helpful for me, um, and what I I think uh, ended with uh, in our in our preparation meeting that we had last week was trying to understand from a flow perspective. Um, you know, uh, I think a number of my colleagues have talked about they want a scanner here or another scanner there or more scanners or, um, and they think you know the number of scanners is is the the limiting factor. Um, you suggested that staffing. Um, will also play a role. And uh, so I'd like you to just kind of go through all the components of what it takes to perform these MRIs. So that's scanners, technicians, radiologists to read the scans, um, you know, patients showing up, budgetary dollars, uh, hours of operation, right? All those various components you have available to you on the, on the, uh, the planning team, which of those do you need to move in order to uh, achieve the benchmark, the the ideal uh, outcomes that we're looking for. Doctor? Yeah, <clears throat> um, it's a very, very difficult question, especially if you want to have a breakdown on the categories, like we have P1, P2, P3, P4. Um, it depends very much on the site. Like if you take, for example, HSC, you can ha have up to 25% in a day, which is P1, emergent, because that's where a lot of these emergent MRI indications are ending up uh, to get care. <clears throat> if you go to a site like Pan Am, uh, they almost have zero. Um, they have almost 100% um, kind of uh, elective cases. Then if you go to, a, like, let's say, a standard site, you could say that probably uh, about between 3 and 5% are urgent, um, about 10, 15% emergent. Um, and then you have a fairly big block uh, that has regular scheduled MRIs for follow-up. Um, and then you have the elective uh, group. But uh, as I said, like it really very much depends on um, on where the uh, um, uh, where the patient, like uh, which side. So, for example, HSC on a Monday morning, we don't schedule regular patients because we know over the weekend um, there's an accumulation of inpatients, emergent patients that we don't even schedule regular patients anymore at that site for the Monday morning and only fill those uh, needs because we wanted to, uh, to meet the, target, uh, the, the targets that, that are set for turnaround time of, of patients. Um, in respect of the second question, of course, it depends on uh, the number of pieces of equipment that are available. 
and we have very good data that outline the number, the population in Manitoba, the uh, estimated population growth uh, has factors that like change in clinical practice um, that, that play into that, which uh, shows an increase of about between 3 and 6 percent per year um, that we have seen. And of course, then we know that's the capacity in the system, taking into account that these machines cannot run 100 percent. They need maintenance. Uh, you will run them out if they are running too fast or too too often. Um, like many, many factors are playing. So we know exactly um, when we hit that time where we need to bring in a new system. Of course, the new system needs to come with operational dollars. Maintenance is a huge issue because we are fairly isolated. Like we have, uh, we have created a, a, a group of uh, technologists and uh, engineers that, are, that, that do the maintenance uh, on site so that we don't have to fly someone in from the US or from other, from other jurisdictions. Uh, that has all uh, taken into account. There's operating dollars for that. Um, um, and then you need uh, normal replacement cycles. If you replace a scanner that's not done in a day, that needs sometimes weeks or even months, depending on how much uh, construction work is associated with it. Um, and then, of course, you need operating, like really individuals that run those uh, scanners. And that's, uh, again, depending uh, very much on where you have those individuals available. And of course, uh, certain locations in the province are uh, challenging to staff. Okay. Mr. Just, Tetzma. Just to follow up, um, I, and I just want to make sure I didn't catch it wrong. You said three to f at a regular site, 3 to 5 percent, urgent 10 to 15 percent emergent. Um, did you mix those up? Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, well, yes, I, see, uh, <laughs> yeah, I see. Less I see Ms. Griff. Sorry, uh, I see Ms. Griff nodding and already in the background. So we'll get the, get back to that. Um, but uh, it sounds like what you're saying is yes, we will need more scanners. Uh, yes, we need more techs. You did not comment on the number of radiologists in the province and if there's a need for. Uh, additional capacity there. Appreciate if you could comment on that. And then, um, you know, you said yes, operational dollars as these new scanners and techs come online is what will be needed as well. But just, uh, yeah, if you could comment on that or, or misheard. Dr. Essig. Yeah, so uh, in respect of radiologists, there's uh, like they have increased substantially because of the increasing number of work. Um, we have also changed uh, to provide shift work now. Radiologists are not working from 8 to 5 anymore. Uh, they work from 8 until 11, uh, and then there is a call coverage. So on-site, uh, really on-site. Um, and then also subspecialized, so that uh, the, the scan is also read by the uh, proper radiologist. Um, that's very important as well. Uh, specifically if we have very complex questions coming out of oncology, neurology, stroke, um, and so on. Um, so um, there's, uh, but because the radiologists are fee-for-service, they are contractors to the system, um, uh, and that's my role as well as the provincial lead to make sure that there is enough coverage that these turnaround times uh, are met. So there are certain turnaround times on how long uh, we are allowed to, or like how, how fast we need to read that scan. And that was uh, in the, like was assessed in the audit as well. And we need, uh, we meet those benchmarks. Uh, actually, we exceed those benchmarks in, in most of the areas. With very few exceptions, which is pediatric, for example. But pediatric is very different because those are very complex cases. You often have them sit and you revisit them uh, not to make a wrong diagnosis, which would have a huge impact on a, on a child. Ms. Naylor. Thank you. Um, I can hear that there's quite a lot of complexity about um, staffing <laughs> from, from what uh, Mr. French and the doctor have shared with us. Um, but I'm wondering if it's possible for the department to, to share with us um, the vacancy rate broken down by RHA for, uh, with, for, what, for all staff required to operate MRIs in Manitoba. Is, there, is that tracked? Do, do you have access to the vacancy rates by RHA?
all staff fall under shared health would be the first observation there. So we don't have breakdown by health authority as such. We are able to look at where our specific current problems are, uh, and particularly for MRI, uh, and it's a small number of, of staff members, as I mentioned earlier. So we know we have acute problems currently in Boundary Trails, uh, in Selkirk, uh, in, in Brandon, and to a lesser degree, but not insignificant, in the Winnipeg area um, as well. So we, we can answer to that, uh, that degree. It, thank you for that, by the way. And just to follow up, building on your previous comment about the need for 11 to 12 additional FTEs across the system or 15 to 16 additional staff, um, and, and I hear that there's some barriers in staffing in certain regions, but is, are, is this also a fiscal barrier? Is there money in the budget for these positions and they can't be filled, or is there not money in the budget to fill these positions, to fill what's needed. Deputy Minister. We have, as part of the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force, we've established a budget that will be available to be used for both uh, the surgical backlog and MRI. I know Dr. Essig is a member of the steering committee. So right now, um, we have the um, project team at work on the proposed allocation of that funding. And so um, some of that work is currently ongoing in terms of what resources are needed to address. Um, I think we've heard more about the surgical backlog, but the MRI related backlog as well. Mr. Michaleski. Um, Questions are specifically on uh, recommendation 17. Uh, that's directed to the department. I think uh, just reading this thing, uh, like the the recommendations made by the Auditor General, I find this this uh, recommendation probably the most one of the most important ones uh, in the whole report because it is talking about data. Um, and this is kind of in line with, with uh, what Mr. Teisman was talking about. And I, I can appreciate that this, uh, the data is, is, can be very complex uh, for planning. But the recommendation, recommendation 17 talks specifically about a new decision-making process. Um, and it also, on the, on the number of bullets, it's talking about the volume of MRI demand. I think we, we touched on that earlier. Uh, the various proposed s scanner locations. Uh, it's talking about the cost uh, benefits of expanding the operating hours. Then we talked a little bit about that. Uh, but it does specifically at the, uh, the Auditor General's recommendation is uh, the department advises that we'll work on developing a new decision-making process or formula for, for MRI. So I guess my question is, uh, where is this at uh, in terms of a, and again, I understand there's a considerable amount of moving parts there, here, but is there a definitive date where you need to have a formula, uh, you know, in terms of where they're gonna be located, like, where is, where is that? And the working group that's compiling this information on the decision making and the recommendation, who comprises uh, the people that are providing input into this formula um, or process? The Deputy Minister. There's actually a few different processes in place um, that address uh, MRI investments. <clears throat> so the first is the Provincial Imaging Advisory Committee, and that committee is the one that uh, provides advice to the government on replacement equipment. So um, because that Provincial Imaging Advisory Committee is um, comprised of radiologists. They're the experts in the field that um, inform Manitoba Health if uh, the performance of an MRI, 
MRI is maybe hitting end of life and subpar. So the replacement equipment goes through that process. Um, the second process is the uh, clinical and preventive service plan. So um, that that clinical and preventive service plan process is is the new one that uh, was created with the establishment of shared health. So shared health is required to work with the five regional health authorities, Cancer Care Manitoba and Shared Health Health Science Centre to identify um, where um, surgical and other specialty programs are going to be established, bolstered, strengthened, so that it can determine where net new uh, MRI equipment would be required in the province. So at this point, as I mentioned earlier, there's no MRI equipment that's been yet identified through the CPSP, but once the Northern Intermediate Hub discussion uh, concludes, in terms of whether it's one location or multiple locations, that would um, undoubtedly provide information on what sort of investment would happen in northern MRI equipment. And then the third uh, place where um, investment decisions and information would come from is from the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force. And that group, their um, their mandate is to deal with recommendations and um, solutions to address the backlog that's arisen from the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Essig is a member of that steering committee. And um, so information on investments related to dealing with the MRI backlog will also come from there. So there's three different processes. The PIC process, Provincial Imaging Advisory Committee, is for the replacement. The provincial clinical planning process is for uh, new MRI locations. And then the surgical and diagnostic task force is related to the backlog. Mr. Michaleski. Just one short uh, final uh, follow-up question uh, regarding the shared health the second point you were talking about was it's a combination of shared health, the five authorities, Health Science Center, um, and that's where new ones would be going, correct? So um, I guess uh, from Dauphin, um, we're within the Prairie Mountain Health Region, which extends from Brandon all the way up to Swan River, large area of, of the province. So what, uh, can you tell me if there's a, effective parkland voice on that steering committee because it is uh, pretty heavily weighted against our region so i just want to make sure that you know that parkland is getting uh, representation deputy minister so on the um, provincial clinical and preventive service plan there are um, provincial clinical teams and the design um, of the teams was made to get at that uh, risk that you're identifying. So the, each team is uh, made up of um, the provincial clinical specialty lead, which generally tends to be uh, a person based in Winnipeg, and the other co-lead of the team uh, is normally a, a, a health expert from one of the regions outside of Winnipeg to try to bring, ensure that the uh, planning processes do not, um, aren't Winnipeg centric, <laughs> if you will. So um, the makeup of the team and the composition of, the, of each provincial clinical team is um, intentionally done that way so that there's representation from each of the seven service delivery organizations. So the five regional health authorities, Cancer Care Manitoba, and Shared Health. Mr. Lindsay. I want to follow up a little more on, on some things you said earlier about uh, WCB and, and other special interest folks that 
access MRI. So you said that for WCB, the plan is they will do it for them in off hours. So my question then is, if there's people there manning MRIs in off hours, or not really off hours, so what makes WCB jump ahead of the queue for other people that are waiting for MRIs? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> like in, in general, like w, WCB patients do not jump ahead, uh, really, because they are scanned at times where these uh, scanners are not operational, where we don't have operational funding for those scanners. Um, and so, that yeah, it's just... Um, there's a contract with WCB, and um, the uh, patients, or like these individuals, uh, I, like whether you call them patients or individuals, they are scanned at times where the scanners are not used, where we don't have funding for the scanners. Uh, it's not that we push out other patients uh, and have them put into that slot. It's just a slot that it's not scheduled for. Mr. Lindsay. So there's no operational funding, so WCB in essence becomes a private healthcare funder and that they pay for the technicians and whatever's required to be there on overtime or, or, or how does that exactly work then? If, if there's no operational funding, but in fact they are operating, how does, how does that work? Deputy Minister. What uh, the, this would have been the WRHA at the time, um, when they first um, moved forward with this arrangement with the um, Workers' Compensation Board, uh, there were discussions between the board and uh, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority to identify a way to provide or problem solve this issue that WCB had raised to the WRHA that very often they had um, clients that were waiting longer than they would like for, um, for an MRI and that oftentimes the MRI was needed to help in the diagnosis of how to have that individual get back, um, you know, on their recovery so that they could re-enter the workforce. And so at the time, this is quite, quite a few years ago, um, the arrangement was that they would um, enter into a contract with the WRHA, so now that contract is with Shared Health, uh, but they would enter into a contract with the WRHA um, to pay for the costs of uh, operating the MRI outside of the regular hours of operation. Uh, so at that time, and I believe this was the Pan Am MRI, uh, the arrangements were for 4 to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and 12.30 to 2 p.m. on weekends. Mr. Smook. Uh, I know these reports are in regards to MRIs and I know technology is changing quite rapidly and I think the comment was made like some of the older MRIs are like an old 54 Chevy and the new ones are like a 2022 Cadillac. Is the technology itself for MRIs changing or is it just the equipment technology that's changing that MRIs will be around here for another 30 years or like I've heard of scanners like a PET scanner or something. Is there different technology that may be replacing the MRIs at one point? Like I know that all that we had years ago was x-rays and then there were CT scans and then MRIs. Whereabouts are MRIs in today's world of technology? Dr. 
It's, um, oh, sorry, I, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, MRI is evolving. Uh, it's still the same technology when it was developed and uh, like the Nobel Prize was given for the development of that technology. So the base technology, it's still the same. Uh, what has changed, what have made um, MRI more uh, efficient, faster, also opening it to uh, other indications. So for example, in the past we couldn't uh, image moving organs, so you couldn't image the heart, you couldn't image the, the lung, and even the abdomen was difficult because like with breathing you're, you're moving, and movement kills the quality of an MRI. Um, uh, that was a lot of, that was computer technology and uh, technology to detect that signal. Like you activate the body and the body sends a signal out, let's just very in a nutshell, and the signal is detected by an antenna. So the antenna technology has improved. The way on how we can process those data that are coming out has become much faster. So it's computer technology and uh, general technology in high frequency um, uh, physics. Uh, that has made the scanners faster and opens those uh, MRIs to way other indications than when I started in 1991. That, like, it's really tr tremendous. At that time, you could only image the brain and the spine. That was all. All the rest was kind of not possible to really scan properly. Um, sure, there are indications that moving away from MRI. Uh, for example, you mentioned PET, PET imaging. Uh, but there's way more indications that go into MRI because we have now um, the possibility to, to scan faster, uh, to scan more body areas, and also um, to look into um, like, comp like a, a, a different dimension which we haven't been able to look for. When MRI started, we looked at anatomy. Um, like we a slice through the body and we then see how what is inside. Today we measure the blood flow, we measure the viability of the tissue. Uh, there's so many things that we can measure. So for example, if an acute stroke patient comes in, like about like three, four years ago, we didn't scan uh, patients with a stroke with MRI. Now every second patient with an, a stroke gets an MRI because we can tell whether the, the stroke has already destroyed the brain or whether they, uh, we can, with modern uh, therapy, uh, like recover that brain tissue that was affected by uh, a stroke. Uh, and this is only possible since a few years, and of course that had increased those indications. So um, therefore, like there's still MRI is the method of choice um, for many diagnostics, and it has got influ influent or influx from CT, from, from uh, even some PET indications are now done with MRI or can be done with MRI and other MRI indications go to PET. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's continuously changing but MRI is still the modality of choice for uh, a lot of indications and, like, and that's more like a negative uh, statement I have to give here. We haven't even, because of capacity issues, we haven't even opened certain indications um, for MRI that are standard in other countries. For example, breast cancer. In many jurisdictions, patients with breast cancer get an MRI today. We can't offer it because we don't have the capacity. The same is with prostate cancer. There are sites in Europe that run a whole MRI with prostate uh, almost every day. Uh, we really don't offer it uh, because we don't have the capacity. Because in the in the uh, like the priority of indications, they are sitting fairly low, but they are becoming slowly the standard of care across uh, Western countries. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lamont. Thank you. Yeah, I just a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the wait time reduction task force. Um, if you could just provide uh, just some details about how, I mean, they must be considering, or I hope that they're considering this report as well, just because clearly that this would, I assume, inform their ability to, this is, a lot of the work's been done, so to speak, um, in terms of the bald and and challenges. So what is, what is the, how does the wait times task force fit in with this? Deputy Minister. There's actually been uh, quite a few reports that we've referred to the uh, Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force. So there was a uh, 2017 
wait time reduction fund report that uh, that's been provided to them. There's um, there's been um, the reports uh, from this OAG uh, audit, and then really anything that we come across that we think may be relevant information for them in their planning, uh, we do provide. So, uh, for example, uh, just as we were preparing for um, this um, this day today. Uh, there was a study done by uh, CADETH, the Canadian Association for uh, Drugs and Technology and Health, that had recently done a report on medical imaging. So we provided um, that to them. Uh, even the uh, CIHI uh, report on wait times from uh, last week. Like really anything that sort of hits the radar, we do provide to them so that uh, they incorporate that into their planning. Okay, Mr. Teichman. Uh, just getting back to the backlog and the capacity, and appreciate the projections that you're making and how you can see uh, a need for greater capacity or need for additional indications that might increase capacity. But when I look at it as a system, um, you know, a year ago, or today we said the backlog uh, was 24 weeks. Um, you know, 10 months to a year ago, it was somewhere in the 23 to 30 week case. So that to me suggests that we actually have sufficient capacity, or at least this year we did, because our wait time at the beginning is the same as the wait time at the end. Um, now, I can appreciate that I'm being simplistic and I'm probably missing something, and that's what I'm asking the question, is, is what am I missing? Uh, am I missing anything? Is it that patients are, are, are dying, that patients are, are leaving, uh, jurisdiction to get the scan done elsewhere and, and leaving and, and getting out of the list or is it just simply a matter of you know if we eliminated this if we had eliminated the the, the, the backlog um, you know taking COVID aside if the backlog has been relatively stagnant year after year if it was 18 weeks five years ago and then 20 weeks four years ago you know all pre pre pandemic um, if it's as simple as just getting those 10 weeks or 12 weeks out of the way and then having the capacity, like, what am I missing? Why, why is, it, or is it in fact that simple that we're that, we're that close to being successful? Because we're able to maintain that relatively stable wait time. Deputy Minister. Um, we do have information on the weights on the Manitoba Health website. And again, it's a point in time uh, and, and it's a, the, our methodology that we've been using for many years is a prospective weight. So um, back in March of 2021, the average was actually up at 31 weeks. It's varied over the year. It, it's dropped uh, as low as 18 uh, weeks during some of those months of 2021. At March of 2022, it was up to 24 weeks. We do think that there is also some pent up demand uh, from people having deferred, uh, even just going to their um, family physician for an annual checkup and that there will probably be some uh, uptake in catch up uh, with delayed care. What has been discussed at the task force, at the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force is defining the backlog. So um, I've heard Dr. McDonald, the chair, say that their um, mandate on the task force isn't to take the 24 weeks to zero, it's to take the 24 weeks to what the wait was uh, pre-pandemic. So that's some of the work that they've been working on. Um, We've seen Doctors Manitoba and others talk about sheer numbers, uh, but I think what we've heard Dr. McDonald say most recently is that the task force would prefer to focus on weight because that's the thing that uh, matters the most to patients. So uh, right now they've been um, doing that analysis on what would address the wait time uh, to get at uh, pre-pandemic levels. Mr. Teitzman. Just following up, I, you know, I very much agree with the uh, the push to 
to use wait time as, a, as an indicator, um, using number of procedures as an indicator is completely meaningless. Saying there's 100,000 people waiting for a procedure that, that should be um, you know, done in one or two months, and then you find out that the pace is actually 50,000 a month, there is no wait, right? Like a, that's actually perfect. Um, but there's no way for an average individual to be able to process those facts and, and, and kind of and parse it. Whereas if you had a wait of only 80,000, but it was getting done at 2,000 a month, well, this is a huge problem, right? And so it's not just the weight or not just the number, but it's the rate and those combined to create the weight. So the weight is the thing to focus on. I appreciate that. Um, but if you could maybe more just directly answer the question of, um, if the backlog is a largely static over these years, um, does that indeed suggest that that capacity is close to what we what we need, or do you think there's something else going on in the system that's easing the the, the backlog? Doctor, yeah, there's <clears throat> multiple factors that play here. Uh, first of all, I, I said before that. Uh, technology is evolving, so we had been um, able to replace some of our very, very old equipment, uh, which brings more efficiency in the system, so we can do more scans per day. Uh, that, of course, uh, is one factor. We had um, um, added a net new pieces of equipment over the last couple of years, um, and we had um, um, like, especially during the pandemic, we really because at the beginning of the pandemic, so many um, scans were canceled and the wait list was going through the roof. Um, we added capacity, like asking for overtime, got overtime funding um, and have added shifts uh, to, um, as I said, like we were running scanners at night even to bring that down to a level which is acceptable or close to. Uh, it's still far away from, from what, what should be the standard, but at least to not have patients wait too long because with every wait time, you of course have an impact on your diagnosis and uh, finally the outcome. We are now only three minutes or so to the suggested end and I only have one other questioner on the list. If there's more, let me know, but Mr. Lindsay, would you like to ask a quick question? Certainly. So I, I've heard you say that uh, it's part of the clinical services plan as to what areas are going to get MRIs. I guess who gets to have input into making those decisions and when can we expect those decisions to be made? Deputy Minister. So the clinical and preventive service plan, uh, the, the first uh, version of it, which came out in uh, 20, actually before the pandemic, it had, um, there had been over 2,000 uh, healthcare providers that had had input into that plan. Um, there also was pretty significant outreach with um, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities with uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit groups. Um, all these things uh, are that we're trying to make it as inclusive a process as possible. Um, recognize there's always more room to uh, get other input and views into the clinical plan. Uh, over time, the plan is that the the clinical and preventive service plan will be refreshed on a regular basis by shared health in conjunction with all of the major service delivery organizations. Uh, but there's really no end to the amount of um, discussion and engagement that we can undertake on the clinical plan. So, um, you know, we remain open to other ideas for input. Mr. Lindsay, for a quick follow up. Last time I looked at the clinical services plan, and to be fair, it was a while ago, the last time I looked at it, there was very little detail on anything in relation to what was going to happen in the north, whether it was a regional center or, or sub-centers. None of that detail was in the plan then. Has that changed now? Deputy Minister. 
So the plan is a guidepost. So it um, tries to outline the broad parameters by which um, individual organizations would do their detailed planning. So we've talked about um, plan provincially, deliver locally. So we would want to ensure that the Northern RHA is using the principles in the plan of care closer to home, uh, trying to focus on establishing uh, major sites that can deliver a broader array of services. So all those things are um, information that the individual service delivery organization, in this case Northern RHA, should build into its annual planning processes. So you'd see a lot more level of detail at the Northern RHA strategic and operational planning level. It's, it's trying to ensure there's alignment to the provincial plan, but done at a more granular level at the region. Thank you. Hearing no further questions or comments, I will now put the question on the report. Okay, so we have used up the two hours that we agreed to. And so we need a, a recommendation from a member of the committee that we actually deal with the questions because we're out of time. Mr. Barton. Sir, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if I can recommend uh, the member for Riding Mountain offer one short question and then we conclude. Okay, what is the will of the committee here then? Do we agree with that? Agreed? Agreed? No. No? Mr. Michaleski? Uh, I would just ask that uh, Mr. Mr. Nesbitt have a question. I also have one more question as well. If I can, if we can get those in. What is the will of the committee? Agreed? If we're all going to have one more question, I'm sure we can all have one more question. <laughs> well, we could continue until we run out of questions, right? I don't see too many more coming, so let's do that. We could spend most of the time talking about this. We could have all the questions dealt with, okay? So, so maybe we should should deal with Mr. Nesbitt's question first. Mr. Nesbitt. Sorry, Chair, just to interrupt. We need a decision. Yeah. That's how we had agreement. You need to recognize Mr. Just to clear up the question. You need to recognize Mr. Oh, yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Lindsay. So if we could sit for another ten minutes, and that would give us time to clear up those questions. Agreed. Okay, it's agreed. been agreed. We're going to sit for another ten minutes. Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I wanted to close with this question, but obviously I'm not going to. Uh, Shared Health took over the operation of diagnostic services in uh, 2017 after this report came out. I'm wondering if you can, in your opinion, tell us about the positive operational and organizational changes that have occurred since then. Uh, the diagnostic imaging program in the past we had um, quite a wide range of divergence between uh, Prairie Mountain and how they operated the program out of Brandon uh, with Winnipeg and how they operated some of their services and with diagnostic imaging and how they operated the services out of Boundary Trails and um, then Selkirk. So uh, the move to shared health does allow us to have um, more common practices and policies, especially in terms of waitlist management and central intake. Um, it also is helpful, um, Shared Health, I think, through the pandemic, has been a great convener of all the major service delivery organizations across the province. And so um, within the pandemic, we've seen some of the benefits of Shared Health having that power and ability to convene uh, multiple uh, clinical stakeholders in decision making. So those have all been positive. Mr. Lindsay, for your final question. Uh, no, I didn't have a final question. Well, you don't, Mr. Michalowski. <laughs> your final question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
yeah, clearly there's lots of things that are changing uh, with this MRI. Uh, right now we've got shared health in here, we've got clinical service plan, we have pandemic, we have labor shortages. So there's lots of things uh, going on here. My question is to the Auditor General, when can we expect or can we expect a follow-up report on the recommendations? The Auditor General. issued in 2017 and we've done our three years of follow-up um, and that was our third and final follow-up <clears throat> so there's nothing in the schedule to do any further follow-up however um, it doesn't mean we can't do a follow-up and there's different options that we, we could um, ranging from going back in and doing a complete audit right from the from top to bottom right from the start again um, to uh, just doing a follow-up getting responses and 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 uh, looking at the at the responses like we do in a traditional follow-up report um, or now there's also options the public accounts committee uh, could um, issue a request for a progress report at some time and um, as is the process with that we will I will uh, um, work with the Public Accounts Committee to look through the, the responses to the uh, progress report and uh, make a decision kind of where to go from there, whether it's to call the department back in to answer further questions, whether it's our office undertaking more um, procedures, etc. So those are some of the options that would be in front of the Public Accounts Committee, but there's nothing right now um, scheduled uh, with respect to MRI services for, from our office. Okay, well, hearing no further questions or comments, I'll now put the question on the reports. Shall the Auditor General's report titled Management of MRI Services dated April 2017 pass? Uh, this report is accordingly passed. Does the committee agree that we have completed consideration of management of MRI services of the Auditor General's report, follow-up of recommendations dated March 2019? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. Does the committee agree that we have completed consideration of management of MRI services of the Auditor General's report, follow-up of recommendations dated March 2020. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. Does the committee agree that we have completed consideration of management of MRI services of the Auditor General's report, follow-up of previously issued audit recommendations dated March 2021? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. The hour being good grief. 8.38. 8.38. What is the will of the committee? Rise, rise. Committee rise.